Hi, so uh, welcome to uh, the speaker today for the Careers Week for St George's. Um, today we've got Francesca Humphrey, who graduated from St George's in 2016. Um, and I'm going to be asking Francesca a few questions about her uh, wonderful career that she now has. Um, and she's going to be reflecting a little bit on, on her experience at St George's as well. And just to say, Francesca was a biomedical science student as well. So um, it's quite an interesting career path that Francesca is going to talk to us about today. Um, so thank you very much, Francesca, for giving up your time. And what you might notice about Francesca, it's the depths of winter here, but Francesca is, is in uh, Tenerife. So she's nice and warm. Um, so um, Francesca, do you want to just tell us a little bit about the um, what you're doing at the moment? Um, so 2016, you graduated. So that's like five years ago-ish at the moment. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what My you're doing? My goodness, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I can't believe it's that long ago. It's scary when you do the numbers like that. Um, I'm currently working in Tenerife um, as a medical interpreter uh, and also freelance translator. So I'm part of a quite a big team um, in one of the major hospitals here in the south of the island. Um, obviously, we have many tourists who don't speak Spanish and we have many doctors who only speak Spanish. So our job is to bridge the gap basically between the doctors and our lovely foreign patients. Uh, I'm also studying um, a master's degree at the moment uh, in translation with the freelance translation on the side. So hopefully on qualification, um, I'll be able to be kind of a fully fledged medical translator and do that as much as I'm doing the interpretation as well. Fantastic. OK, brilliant. So that's quite quite an unusual job, but also one that sounds really exciting and um, having that contact with patients as well. And um, how did you decide to go into that role? Yes, yeah, so it was quite a random one. When I started at George's, I had no real clue, actually, that it even existed as a career path. Um, but I had done a gap year in Spain before I started at George's, so I had those roots already down. Um, and in fact, I heard about the job because a friend of mine uh, got rushed into a and &E. I went with them and we found a mutual friend there working in the A&E department. Um, so like, Juan, what are you doing here? He said, I work as a medical interpreter. I said, no way, no way is that a job. That literally sounds like the perfect thing. You've got the medical side of things, which I love and I'm studying at the moment, and the language side of things, which has always been kind of a passion of mine. And, um, and it all kind of stemmed from there. I then continued with George's. Um, and when I qualified, I came out here to study uh, Spanish because I didn't actually speak Spanish at that point I only spoke French and German uh, and did my language uh, certification and then was able to kind of apply for jobs as an interpreter. Wow gosh fantastic so you obviously had a bit of a flair for languages anyway in the first place did you said you already spoke French and German is that is that something you learned yourself or was that something just through your own connections? Um, I come from a German family so unfortunately, I wasn't actually spoken to in German, but I think that gave me that initial passion for languages. I think there'll be probably many people at, at George's that come from those kind of multinational, international backgrounds and maybe yeah. have a different language being spoken at home. Um, so I think that always kind of impassioned me a little bit with my language studies at school. And um, I went to a secondary school that specialised in languages. So it was always pushed quite hard on, uh, in that respect. And I then studied uh, French at A level. So I had quite a good level by the time I left school. Um, and then I uh, just had the language, the Spanish left that I needed to learn. And I think once you've got a few languages, it's easier to then learn another one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, because once you've cracked it, you know you can do it. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe exactly. And I, I, just, I think if it's, if it's something that you enjoy, it's yeah. always easy to learn. If it's something that you really find interesting, then learning it is enjoyable rather than, you know, studying and oh, how boring. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, that's really commendable. So you went out and you learned Spanish yourself when you were out in, in Tenerife. Um, and so how did you actually get the job in the first place? How did you get the job of, of being a, a medical interpreter? Did you have, did they, did you apply for one or was it advertised or was it just through the people that you know? No, it was, it was advertised. So here, I mean, in Spain, like in all countries, you have that kind of, you know, indeed.com and all these kind of job sites. Um, so I just looked for, it, looked for it on a job site and had a couple of interviews with different kind of centres. We have a lot of private hospitals out here. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so there's different, quite a few opportunities actually. Okay. Uh, but d- during the um, during my studies, I mean, it took me how long was I studying Spanish? I mean, it took a good year to be studying part time because I had to work while studying because I had to pay for the language studies. Um, and so I was able then to work as a light and sound technician, which was skills that I picked up as technical officer at George's. So I worked with another fantastic biomed for two years as technical officer as part of the student union. And then with that kind of under my belt, was able to um, work as this kind of, this, in a similar role, light and sound technician for an entertainment company here in Spain. So I did both at the same time. And then once I had that certification, because obviously to be an interpreter, you need to have quite a good level of language. Um, then I was able to go on for my current role. Wow, okay. So, so some more skills that you had acquired over your time at, at St George's. <laughs> Again, something that interested me. I think that's the key thing. If you find something interesting, pursue it, because you never know when it's going to come, uh, come in handy later on. Yeah, no, exactly. And it shows like it shows that it ha- can come in handy. It just you seem to have really made the most of what you've developed over the years. Um, I was going to ask then leading on from that. So in terms of your course um, here at George's, um, what do you feel that you gained that helped you uh, in securing this particular job? What, what do you feel you, the skills that you, that you gained or the knowledge that you gained from, from your biomedical science studies? Well, I mean, biomedical science gives you a fantastic grounding in phys- all the things medicine, really. Apart from treating patients, you get a really good grounding in all of the theory behind physiology and anatomy, which has been incredibly important in translating, because you need to know, obviously, you're translating for a lay person, but you still need to understand what the doctor's talking about to then translate it to the patient. Mm-hmm. So that's been incredibly helpful. I mean, the degree in general, I mean, I think the course at George's is fantastically done. I really enjoyed anatomy. I mean, the fact that we were doing dissections is something I still haven't found anybody that had the similar kind of um, teaching that I had at George's with that. Later on, when you go into the lab, I think that it's an opportunity to see if that's something for you or not. Unfortunately for me, it wasn't. I, I mean, it's fascinating, but I just, I, I'm a bit too, got a bit too much energy. I struggled a little bit to kind of be focused and patient and accurate with all the measuring and reading correctly to have medicinal places. It wasn't quite for me. But again, to have the opportunity to see that side of biomedicine and see if it's for you, for many people it is for them. They've then gone, some of my peers have gone into research, which is a fantastic way to go. Um, you kind of develop interests in unusual, well, I don't say unusual, but you know, particular specialities. So genetics for me, the genetics lecturers at George's were just top notch. Um, I already found this interesting, but my interest in it soared through my like set of lectures, that unit that we did um, in the third year of genetics. So I think it gives you, from an academic point of view, it gives you a fantastic grounding in the world of medicine, biomedicine, and can set you up for, so you don't necessarily have to be clinical. There's, I know some people as well that are writing, some medical writers, not necessarily translating the writing, but actually writing stuff um, for journals and magazines and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And then from the side of view of Georgia's itself, it's such a small university that you get to do so much. So I was technical officer, I was able to be quite um, highly involved in hockey. So I did captaincy and presidency of the hockey club as well, which gives you fantastic kind of confidence and leadership skills. And you really do get friends for life as well. I mean, despite being here and I've been here now for three years, I've still got my closest friends are still the ones that are in London, you know, most of them are medics, but they're still in London and we still meet up whenever we can. And I think that friendship, those bonds that you get at George's as well set you up for life because they give you a fantastic kind of feeling of belonging and support. You have that support network then that supports you to push on and really achieve things later on in your career. Mm. That's lovely. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and you mentioned medicine. Um, when you Were you always going to go on to biomedical science when you were doing your A-levels? Was that what you were planning? What Because what, um, a lot of people want to do medicine, so they come to, to do biomedical science, but there's loads of other options, aren't there, that you can do um, apart from just medicine. But, but tell me a bit, bit about what you were planning to do when you were about 18. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, um, I had the usual kind of, 
biology, biology and chemistry, focusing on that, applied to med school, got a place um, to study medicine at Leicester University. Um, my grades came in and I didn't have the grades to study medicine. And it was one of those moments where you think this is absolutely the worst day of my life. What, what am I going to do? I've just turned 18 and everything's over. Like my life plan's finished. Um, and so I just went on holiday because that seemed the only <laughs> good solution at the time. And whilst I was away, I got offered a job and that's how my gap year started was being abroad and kind of working in the entertainment industry in terms of events and um, shows. Uh, and so I had then the choice really between coming back and applying again for med school because I had a remarking and then I did have the grades and well, a little bit complicated and boring and a long time ago now uh, but instead my careers advisor at secondary school kind of said look if not you could go the biomedicine route and that way you can apply with the grades you have um, and just kind of go that way so I thought perfect so I applied to George's without having visited it because I was just chilling in Spain uh, and luckily when I arrived loved it and it was the best choice I could have made I think probably in first year I had Perhaps, you know, in the back of your mind, just thinking there's that intercalation, there's the chance still to kind of go into medicine. And then I think quite soon I recognised that medicine was perhaps not the journey for me. And I felt incredibly blessed, actually, to not have ended up up in Leicester on a medicine course for five years. So if I could go back to myself now and say it may seem like the worst moment of your life, but actually it's the best thing that can happen to you, you know, I really would. But um no, uh, with um, with the biomedicine type of thing, I do. I would love to say, you know, to biomed biomedics, if you want to do medicine, fantastic. But equally, biomedicine on its own is a fantastic kind of area to be in, and um, and just have a bit of confidence in yourself and and pursue your interest. If biomedicine is something that fascinates you, use it, and there's so many things you can do with it. Yeah, no, that's that's great advice. I think it's 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 a real good grounding, um, and the skills that you pick up, like the science skills, um, it, it, even just just the science skills are fantastic. You've got a science degree at the end of it that can be applied to so many different jobs with problem solving, and just that understanding of the complexities within science. You've got you've worked all of that out and you're familiar with it and that can be a grounding for things within science but equally outside of science as well but yours kind of straddles both in a way doesn't it with you doing the interpreting um well yeah eventually eventually but equally a degree is a degree i mean at the end of the day you yes. have by the end of your time doing biomedicine you're going to come out with a bsc on and that's what employers are looking for a lot of the time, regardless of whether you even stay in science, just because you maybe you enjoyed your three years and studied something and it was fantastic and you had a great time at George's. It doesn't mean you have to stay in that in that area. You can move off and do other things. And with that, you know, BSc on your on your curriculum, it really, really opened doors. Yeah, yeah, no, it, absolutely. There's so, so many options. That That's great to hear. Um, so um, I'm just trying to think from... Um, do you want to just maybe tell us a little bit, just going back to the current role that you're doing, um, and we'll perhaps finish off thinking a little bit about what you, advice you might give to St George's students, but, but just kind of going back to the role that you're doing at the moment. Can you tell us about a typical day uh, in your uh, role that you do? Absolutely. So, um, I mean, in, the, in, my, in my job where I work, you kind of have two ways to go. You can either be um, kind of based more in the main hospital or based in the A&E department. So there's not many people that are up for A&E because it can be a bit um, gory, <laughs> but I kind of from the first day was like, yeah, I'm up for that. I've, I've done all, I've seen all of that at George's. I'm, I'm more than happy to kind of be in that environment. So I am between both, but mainly based in the A&E department. Um, we have an office and as soon as we have a patient in that doesn't speak Spanish, we get a call from the doctor requesting the language combination. So we have over 20 languages based in our hospital because we have to cover all the Scandinavian languages as well. So as soon as you've got, as, I, as soon as I'd have someone, for example, that speaks French or English or German, I'd be kind of called across and you're there right from the word go. So you'll meet the patient, you'll introduce the doctor to the patient because they can't really even introduce themselves. You kind of explain who they are. Um, and then straight away you have initial assessment, so you'll have to be asking the patient all the questions that obviously the doctor needs to ask to make that initial assessment, replying, um, getting a good clinical history. And then later you'll kind of 
you'll be covering multiple patients at once, but you'll basically cover their whole journey through the NE department. And in the end, if they have to be admitted, then you kind of pass them off to your team in the main hospital. But in the main hospital, um, your roles will include ward rounds. So you go around and do the ward rounds every single morning with the doctors. And then you'd often be an outpatient in the afternoon, translating in outpatients, basically. So any kind of patients coming in for follow-up with their consultants, you're there to help help that step. But you're, you're translating a lot of clinical language, but also because, I mean, some doctors don't quite have a knack of how to work with a translator, so they kind of act as if the patient's not there. So you kind of end up giving a lot of that reassurance as well. You're the one to smile and to hold their hand and say, don't worry, it's going to be absolutely fine. So there's that social side of things as well and that caring role as well, which is really lovely. But I don't have to make any decisions about keeping anybody alive, which is perfect for me because I don't think I'll be able to deal with that kind of pressure. Mm. Gosh, it sounds it sounds like it's perfect for you in terms of what you, you're looking for. It's just taking advantage of all your skills together, hasn't it? Um, and, you know, best yeah, of the well, world. There's no nights, no nights, which uh, is super. Oh, that's great. Okay. <laughs> no, so who, no who nights. Does nights? <laughs> who does the nights in A&E if somebody comes well, in for the next day? <laughs> no, luckily it's their, their contactable via. So I think, in fact, in England you have language line. We have a similar thing that runs in the evenings, but it appears that most tourists don't seem to get that ill during the night, which is super. It just <laughs> seems to happen during the day, so it's nice, nice working hours for me. <laughs> Great. Okay, that's that's an added bonus, isn't it? My goodness. Yeah. Wow. Okay, lovely. All right. So um, um, I think I kind of know the answer to this because you've almost expressed it already. But so what would you say are the, me are the best bits of the job that you do? Um, I love working as part of a team. Uh, I think that's definitely something I would imagine, whether you're medic or, or non-medic, working in a hostel, that's something you're always going to have is that feeling of teamwork and working as part of a team. Um, I love the fact that I get to use my languages every day. I love the fact that I learn something medically new every day. You're, off, you're seeing all sorts of illnesses and well, that sounds a bit weird. It's fine, everyone's at George's, they know what I mean. When you're seeing a new sort of clinical presentation of something that's fascinating or a disgusting break uh, of some kind of bone, that's always fascinating as well. Um, so yeah, that kind of learning something new every day is just fantastic and I mean you can get that from probably all of the different medicine fields but certainly with interpretation it's something that you 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 get to enjoy and learning I mean you see something new and then you think gosh actually I don't know how to say that in German what a disaster so you're desperately trying to look up the terminology in your medical glossary to trying to work out actually what that is because you've never heard of that particular disease so it, it can be quite stressful um but no I've, I mean if anyone speaks languages or or has a passion for languages and would want to learn a language I mean I couldn't more highly recommend it as a as a career. Fantastic so it sounds like you've got a bit of slack there to be able to build up and learn you don't have to be totally perfect at it before you start you, you, you obviously it's a growing training learning terminology in the different languages I mean so do you find you're using French and Spanish and German kind of an equal measure or do you kind of have to have to focus more on um English I suppose is probably one of the big ones isn't it but the, 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 ma the main language absolutely is English um it depends on seasons we, we do a lot of seasonal work here so it really depends what nationality is on holiday but in terms of languages I mean Tenerife or Canary Islands in general Spain you have a lot of French, German, English, Norwegian and um, Swedish people so those kind of languages are important but for anyone that perhaps has other types of languages, you can just see where your language is prevalent and look to do your job there. So it might be that you don't end up somewhere as kind of funky as Canary Islands, but equally in London, you've got many types of languages that are being spoken that perhaps wouldn't be as useful in the Canary Islands, but equally my languages probably wouldn't be that useful in London because there's probably not an awful lot of French and German people that are getting ill and needing interpreters. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to play to your strengths a little bit as well, pursue what interests you, and then later you kind of, of course, you can't set ridiculous goals. If you, if you don't speak any language that's useful in a certain place and you might need to then just readjust a little bit where you're going to do your career. But that's nice. You can really just choose, look at the globe almost and see where your language is spoken and, and head there. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great advice, actually. Yes, it's, it shows it's, it's not just in the Canary Islands, it's all over the world that there'll be opportunities for people with, with, with that. Absolutely. I mean, in all, in all countries, they need interpreters. It just depends which kind of foreigners are in those places and therefore need their language to be spoken. But in terms of medical translation, um, my first month on the job, I had to shadow a team, someone in my team, because obviously it's important to translate correctly. You can have real issues with translating the wrong thing in, in many scenarios. And so the idea is you have a language base and you learn the vocabulary. It's completely accepted that you're not going to know every single word. You're not going to be able to say everything perfectly. The point is that you're as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you kind of speak a language and you think, oh, my goodness, but I wouldn't be able to, you know, translate that term or I wouldn't be able to express that in my other language. It's incredible how quickly you do learn those things. So you don't, by no means, you don't walk into it being a fully fledged medical interpreter is absolutely something that you tend to develop on the job and you're constantly improving. Mm -hmm. No, fantastic. Yeah, no, it sounds amazing. Um, and so would you say there are any downsides particularly to the, to the job itself? Is there anything, um, obviously we've sp spoken about what you enjoy most, what would you say are the things, obviously all jobs have their good and bad bits to them, some bits that are a little bit tougher than others. Any, any comments on um, what's tough? I think for me, the hardest thing has been breaking bad news, but that's something, you know, again, it's not necessary. It's not, I'm not the one that's breaking that bad news, but to interpret it and be actually the person that the loved ones are looking at and kind of feeding off of, that's really difficult. Very, very difficult. Mm. Um, the hours, I mean, the days are long. They're long shifts. You're on your feet the whole time. But again, if, it's something that you'd see in many jobs, long hours, being on your feet. Those are things that you're going to see in, in many places. But I mean, I can't, I just, I love the jobs. It's difficult really to think of too many negatives. Later on, of course, you're, you are, you're, you're limited about where you do the job, which is what I was speaking about before. So if, for example, I wanted to move back to London and be a medical interpreter, I wouldn't, I perhaps would, could work for something like language line. So you're covering a larger area in order to provide that interpretation. But perhaps I wouldn't be able to be based in one hospital, which is quite a luxury here, but I'm just based in one place with a huge team because we have that high frequency of um, international patients in our hospital. So that's perhaps difficult, but then that's why I've branched off into translation because that's something you can then do. So translation is like written, um, the written form of translation interpretation is spoken mm -hmm. so to be able to do that freelance work from anywhere so that's it really i think just yeah but again you can always adapt yourself you just adapt each new thing that comes along you adapt you adapt you adapt mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no that's very good advice um, and and actually on the on the on the part that you're playing in in breaking bad news and and the kind of pressure that you're under part of the theme of the week that we're running for careers week is about well-being and, and looking after yourself um, it, within within health or medical professions, but actually in careers in general, where everybody has stress and pressures from from jobs. And I suppose particularly at the moment, there's a lot of pressure going on with the differences in working and the coronavirus and you know the, all of that adding to, to people's pressures. And um, do you have any advice on well-being, on how to cope? How how do you manage those pressures? Um, I, I mean, I'm a massive advocate for sport. Uh, I've always been involved in all the different sports teams, so exercise is incredibly important. I think you've got to try, I know that even in a job you love, there can be hard moments, but I think it's important to recognise if you really are doing a job that you love, I think it's important to be enjoying what you're doing, and if not, change. So even when I'm having hard moments, I can at least be happy with the fact that I'm enjoying what I'm doing and I'm, I'm sure of of the career path that I've chosen. And apart from that, despite being so far away from my family, so all of my family is still in the UK, I think being in constant contact with family is so, so important. I mean, I speak, at the moment I'm speaking to my mum every day, my nan kind of five days a week, just in constant, constant contact with them, so that you feel that you've got that support network, you're constantly making, kind of rebuilding those ties and feeling like you're part of a network really, so you don't feel isolated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that, that sounds like great advice. Thank you, Francesca. Um, no, that, that, that's really important. Thank you. Um, so um, I think um, 
In terms of then the general advice, you know, from kind of a career decision making, um, what you can do when you're at university. I mean, is there is there any advice from your experience that you would give to students who, who are currently studying with us? And those that have just recently graduated as well. I think yeah, I think speaking more for the biomedics. Um, I know George's obviously does a lot to show that there are other options out there apart from medicine, but having been there myself, I know that when you're surrounded, when you're in that environment, you can sometimes feel like medicine is the only option. And if you're not interested in intercalating or you're not interested in doing medicine, you can feel a little bit kind of different to everybody else, that that is almost the only way to go. That is the best way to go. So I think just have that confidence in yourself, have confidence in, you know, the decisions that you're making, pursue things that uh, excite you and interest you. Um, and I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that my career existed till my second year of George's. And even then I didn't know anybody, I didn't know how to get into it from England. I didn't know anybody that had done that career UK based. So I just kind of followed what I enjoyed at George's kind of getting involved in all the things that I found interesting. And I think eventually, if you kind of just are following that little trail of things that you like and things that interest you, you do end up finding your way kind of meanderingly <laughs> to something, a career that is right for you. There's, I don't kind of think you need to identify right now where you're going to go to and get there. It's a lovely way actually to just kind of stepping stone through different things till you find something that is suitable for you or something that you really want to do don't mm -hmm. don't have that kind of medic pressure of you know choose now what you want to do and aim for it and get there and because there is time and I love the fact that I haven't gone from A to B I, I love all the points that I've gone through and it has rounded me more as a person and I have picked up skills that have now made me suitable for the role I want to do. Without having gone through all those kind of random places, I actually wouldn't be qualified to do what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just don't stress and be sure in yourself and enjoy biomedicine because it's a fantastic course and it really can open doors for you. Mm -hmm. Wow, fantastic. Okay, Th thank you so much, Francesca. That is lovely advice. And I love the way you talk about stepping stones. That's a very nice way of putting it. And sometimes your stepping stones can go in zigzags <laughs> and sometimes they can go straight and they fall over the place. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, I think that because medicine is one of those careers where you kind of get on the medicine train and then you just go, you know, you're kind of, everything is quite, what's the word, kind of guided, everything's set out. You really do have to go from A to B, from B to C. For, you're going through, you're passing all your exams. You then got F1, F2, and from there you, and I think for a biomedic, that can be almost overwhelming in itself because you think, crumbs, all of my other people, my peers have this very set path and I actually don't know where I'm going. And that can be very overwhelming at the time, especially if you don't know at all where you, what you want to do. So it's absolutely fine to meander around. And for me, it's worked out fantastically. So it can absolutely for all of those students as well. Yeah, yeah. So kind of have faith and just try out different things that appeal to you and interest you. Um, and that, that you Exactly. Know, you because there's so many careers you. out there. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy which careers exist. So it may well be that you fall into a career that you had no idea existed, but really ticks all of the boxes. Yeah, yeah. I think the important thing as well is that you've been doing, you've always taken on these experiences, haven't you? So just trying them out. So even like the gap year was one that, that introduced you to that, to this idea of building up languages as well. So it's, it's that case of like chipping away at it and just keep trying out different things and, and seeing where that takes you. Brilliant. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Thank you so much for your time today, Francesca. I think that's all the questions we're going to grill you with today, but we, it's been really okay. inspirational hearing about your wonderful career. Um, it sounds so exciting. Um, and, it's, and the fact that you're, you've traveled with it as well is, is, is wonderful. Um, and um, I just wish you every luck with your future career um, and with your masters that you're doing at the moment. Um, okay, and, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today uh, for, for our Careers Week. So uh, it's lovely it's to meet you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Francesca.